Good morning, afternoon or evening everyone, depending on which time zone you're in and welcome to World of Darkness new show, episode 20, I believe. We're already doing it for 20 weeks, can you believe? It's been a very uh, wonderful variety. We had tons of amazing guests on the show so far and we're going to get only more, including in this episode when we are actually going to have one of my favorite authors of the past few months, I gotta say. I actually... Uh, spend a wonderful, wonderful time uh, being on the little vacations at my family and uh, walking through the forests, listening on my phone to Walk Among Us and the particular novella that Caitlin Starling wrote. It was a really good time and I would love to get deeper into um, what actually drove the author to write this particular novella today in the stream. But we also will have a lot of other news to share and a lot of other things, starting with, of course, the interview, but but right after that, the EGX panel, during which the World of Darkness developers uh, joined in to talk together about how to make World of Darkness games and uh, about their passion to the, to the World of Darkness. And uh, uh, seen from a, three different settings, Vampire the Masquerade, Where of the Apocalypse and Wraith the Oblivion. Uh, the panel happened on the EGX just two days ago, but we have it uh, recorded and on YouTube right now for you guys to see. So I would love to talk a little bit more about that as well. We have uh, the Dev Diary from Werewolf the Apocalypse, Heart of the Forest Developers. We also have the release date for Vampire the Eternal Struggle 5th Edition card game. We also have Vampire the Masquerade Night Road coming just next week. And I have some nice character reveals to show you guys today. But we're going to start with the interview with Caitlin. And I'm going to connect to her right now to see if she's waiting for us. Caitlin, hello. Hello. Hey, super nice to see you. Uh, uh, so how are you feeling today? <laughs> pretty good. Early over here so far. <laughs> uh, you look wonderful and I absolutely love how your necklace is playing with the cover of your book right behind you. It looks absolutely wonderful. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So can we start uh, very briefly with the introduction? Um, you are known uh, to our audience from Vampire the Masquerade, Walk Among Us, uh, trio novellas um, that are set in the world of vampire. You are the author of the third of them, uh, The Land of Milk and Honey. But could you please introduce yourself in your own world to World of Darkness audience? Yes. Yeah, so, um my name is Caitlin Starling. I am a novelist. Um, a along with my World of Darkness novella, I've also written The Luminous Dead, which is a sci-fi horror caving uh, book, full length, and Yellow Jessamine, which just came out, which is a more gothic tragedy with lots of poison short novella that came out September 5th. Um, other than that, I've worked a little bit in interactive theater. I've, I've messed around here and there with audio productions. And yeah, it was a, it was a really fun, um, really fun request to to be brought in on a, a World of Darkness project. Awesome. So let's go back to the very beginning. And I would love to ask you, what was your first contact with World of Darkness in general? I was probably around, this is early 2000s, I was probably 14 or 15. And I think what happened, um, it's one of two things. It's of course very fuzzy at this point, but it was either I found um, the Book of Nod in my local comic store and I liked, I thought it was very cool and goth looking, so I picked it up. Or um, it was my friend Oliver who, I can't remember if we knew we both liked it and that's why we started talking about it or if he introduced me to it, but he was very much um, a Clan mm -hmm. guy. <laughs> um, and from there, I read a lot of the early 2000s Clan novels. And I also watched Kindred the Embraced several times in a oh. row. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then, in, and I never actually got to play. I didn't have um, sort of a, a friend group that was interested enough in, in the time of that to, to really build a world in. So it was something that I engaged with sort of just, I liked reading about the lore. I liked reading the rule books, but I never actually got to, to really play in the world at all. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of people like that. And I feel like I also, as much as I was role playing a bit back in the days, I still like really got into role playing Vampire the Masquerade just in the last few years. So, uh, Caitlin, it's never too late. After reading, uh, actually listening to your book, I'm very much eager to play with you one day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, speaking of The Land of Milk and Honey, how did that, that novella happen? 
So we went through several ideas before we landed on what became the land of milk and honey. Um, and I usually tend towards very isolated horror stories. It's, it's very fun for me to play with um, putting a character all on their own and seeing what happens to them. And so my other ideas were kind of in that vein, but the team was really interested in, in doing something that had to do with community and had to do with, um, if not necessarily politics, then at least the interplay of, of desires and um, and goals that, that various, you know, people with vampires and not would have. And I, at the time, lived in Portland, Oregon. I, I lived there for about eight years before moving out to Chicago, where I am now. And, you know, I had, this was actually gonna be my first time writing something set in modern day. And I was like, okay, what do I know? What do I feel comfortable writing? Because I am not really a club kid. <laughs> I'm kind of very um, quiet and retiring in a lot of ways, but I am really obsessed with farming. Um, when I'm not reading science fiction and horror and fantasy or writing it, I am often reading farming memoirs. <laughs> and, you know, Oregon has great land. It has people who really, really like sort of these back to nature sort of feelings. And I was like, you know what? I can put a story on a commune. And I, and I, and I really wanted to write, um, I've always wanted to write a farming memoir, but in a fictional setting. That's always fascinated me, the idea of playing with the very mundane and the very fantastical at the same time. And I realized this would be a great place to do that in. Yeah, I, I need to follow up on this because I've never thought that by listening to Vampire the Masquerade novella, I will actually learn a lot about farming and handling livestock. That was very much of a new <laughs> thing for me, but I loved it. And uh, it just like, it sounded that either you did a lot of the study and research on the subject before, or you actually were involved in, in similar matters. So what's the case in here? <laughs> um, I have never worked with livestock. Mm -hmm. I have done some limited gardening and stuff. Mostly it's just me being a nerd and, and reading a lot. However, I have taken butchering classes, which shows up in a couple scenes um, in terms I've taken a class on how to take apart a pig and also ducks. Um, very brief classes, nothing sort of professional level, but it gave me sort of a hands-on, um, I know what it feels like to do it, even if I don't know what it feels like to do it very well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, actually, yeah, like the moments uh, describing, you know, handling livestock and then butchering and, uh, and not only butchering, but also like taking care of sheep in, in this novella where uh, just like either they cause shivers down my spine or were just extremely interesting. And they all, of course, uh, uh, surround the character Lee, who is, uh, I believe, a toriator, right? She's uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, very much of a... I think one of the most interesting Toreaders I've ever read about and role played with. Like this is the kind of a character um, that I always wanted to to explore, even though I didn't know that. And uh, it's very interesting how she actually looks at and describes sheep as livestock, and this very much mirrors some of her views on mortals. Actually, how did you approach the design of Lee? So. The whole livestock thing is really interesting because, of course, um, you can spin it in a way that seeing something as livestock is to be dehumanizing isn't the right word, but is to be dismissive of mm -hmm. them being living creatures, you know, their, their property that you own and their food. But in reading farming memoirs, especially shepherding memoirs, I've come across the fact that most people who, who raise livestock like that, especially very in very direct circumstances, um, don't really see it that way. Um, that livestock is in fact sort of a relationship. It's based around, you know, a give and take of, I will provide healthcare and a safe place and food for you. And in return, at some point I will take something for me. Um, and the, the best kinds of shepherding are often seen as the ones where the sheep don't even really realize you're there most of the time, because that's not the point. The point isn't for you to be imposing yourself on them, except of course at the very end <laughs> when you turn them into food, but it's to, it's to have a, a, system set up where the sheep can or whatever can you know be their most animal selves while you have because you know, if the more the more you have to interact with them the more you're going to stress them and all this stuff and so reading about that you know it's a very easy sidestep to go well if you have to live off of humans anyway wouldn't it be more humane to do it that way instead of um bewitching them or hunting them on the streets and you know because when you're when you're there's a discussion in the novella of, you know, the argument of, are we parasites or are we predators? Yeah. Um, because in a lot of ways, of course, vampires are more parasites than anything else. They, they can't do things in the open. And, um, you know, 
whether you're a predator or a parasite though, you're mostly going to be going after prey that is not missed, which has a lot of moral and ethical implications. And so this is a very weird, very uncomfortable space to play in and, and, and taking it in the direction of livestock. It's also very uncomfortable. We don't want to think of other, as readers, we don't want to think of other humans as livestock. Um, and I wanted to put the reader in the mindset of somebody who doesn't have an issue with that concept mm -hmm. because that on its own is very uncomfortable. And I wanted to make it in a, write it in such a way that listeners or readers felt themselves or realized, you know, five chapters in, wait a minute, I've, I've been going along with this the whole time. What does that say about me? <laughs> exactly. I had the same feeling because I was trying to analyze what Lee was doing in my head. And when she was describing, you know, the, the way that she approached sheep and she seemed to be caring almost and uh, actually trying to do it in the most humane and ethical way. But then I realized that she's doing the same thing to mortals. <laughs> and it kept on getting more and more uncomfortable in my head that I'm actually trying to excuse her. Uh, but then again, she, although, you know, it is maybe not the very first idea that a lot of players have, you know, livestock farming and a torator, it just works so well. How did you incorporate the clan in all of this? Yes. Yeah, so I, when I was doing my, my getting back up to date um, with every, you know, with, with the lore and everything else, there is, you know, I came across the mention of Toridors, some of them really loving, very elegant, beautiful systems. Mm -hmm. um, that systems and processes can be a form of art, which I very much agree with personally. And, um, I, you know, I was actually never really attracted to playing or, or thinking about Toridors just because I was like, oh, they're just artistes. They're very, you know, the very stereotypical version is not something that I was very interested in. But, you know, I'm a professional author. That's the type of artist. I do a lot of fiber crafts. I do a lot of cooking. And those are all the same part of, there's, they access the same part of me. And so I was like, okay, I can explore a wider range of what it means to, to be an artist and to be attracted to beauty and to be attracted to how things get made. Um, and, you know, if I associate fiber craft and cooking and, and farming and writing and all this stuff, so could another character. Um, and so Lee is sort of an exaggerated part of, of that section of my psyche. That's awesome. And speaking of uh, using the mechanics uh, from Varmer the Masquerade and using the source materials in your book, I've actually noticed that you've used a plenty of discipline powers and uh, other systems such as resonance, for example. So uh, when you were uh, checking out the, the source materials, what was your approach to, you know, which kind of a parts of it you wanted to use and what inspired you the most? So I never made say an actual character sheet mm -hmm. um, to check to make sure everything that I was coming up with made sense. But what I would do while I was reading through mainly the core, the core book was I would take notes on things that would be helpful for Lee to be able to do. And then as I was writing, because I was continuously going back to the material, things that she was already doing that I hadn't thought about in terms of actual powers. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of things in edits that we ended up, or I decided I wanted to change because they didn't quite line up. They didn't quite make sense for her clan or for um, particularly the fact that Lee subsists off of bad blood, which is very limiting. So even though she is older than the other um, protagonists in, in the novella trio, she sometimes doesn't like it. <laughs> Maybe it may have been 50 or more years since she was embraced, but she doesn't necessarily behave that way and she doesn't necessarily have all that goes along with that. Um, so it, it was very rarely a conscious, I'm going to make her use this ability in this situation, but it was something where I was um, trying to be mindful of, of making it approximately reasonable, mm -hmm. uh, with some, you know, blurring to make it a better story. <laughs> um, and in particular, Resonance, though, was a fairly late addition because I realized I needed a source of, of conflict among the, the, the vampires who do know about how the commune works. Um, that it couldn't just be an issue of supply because supply would have always been an issue. You know, you can't take very much um, blood from any given human. It takes about two months for blood, red blood cell count to actually return to a level that is that is reasonable. And, you know, of course that, that that is a source of tension, but the bigger source of tension was, okay, do we diversify our operations? Do we make this, you know, this is already farm to table <laughs> service. Do we also, you know, we cater to, to, to Ventru um, mm -hmm. subscribers to make sure that they get, you know, their particular live feeds of whatever type that they want. But why don't we start trying to enhance and provoke certain responses among certain of our community members so that the blood takes on a certain flavor? Um, it's a very gourmet 
<laughs> approach to slug farming. If I was a Camarilla you know? prince of that city, I would absolutely love that idea. And I would just, you know, fund that research. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask, there's one question from one of our watchers. Of course, feel free to skip it if you think it's a little bit too spoilery. But um, there was a very particular moment in the book where Lee, let's just say, she behaves very high. Uh, she goes to the field <laughs> and she has those visions. So what happened there? <laughs> um, so the blood that she was given before that was subject to some Tremere experimentations that mm. she was not aware of. Uh, <laughs> and I won't go more into detail than that just because it is it gets into spoiler territory about why that is. Mm -hmm. um, the part of it was I, I actually wrote that bit out of context because um, there's a lot of interesting things, when a lot of interesting concepts when you're playing with the idea of Cain and Abel and all that sort of noddest lore because Abel is... Um, or Cain's the farmer and Abel's the hunter, I believe. And of course, if I'm getting this wrong, it's ridiculous because I wrote this entire passage. <laughs> but it's not what you would expect. Um, yeah, Cain's the farmer because he ends up, because it's, okay, why is the one who isn't the hunter the one that becomes violent? Um, and so there's this whole thing of, okay, well, if we're descended from Cain, then does that make us farmers? Mm -hmm. But we've, you know, and was he farming when he started? If, you know, if the lore is true that he's the reason why humans started gathering in cities, that's a type of farming. That's a type of agriculture. Um, and, you know, it, it's sort of trying to figure out what the implications of that are. But generally speaking, Lee is not the sort of person who would think about that thing. Absolutely. And so I had this entire, you know, just sort of ex exploratory monologue written. And I was like, well, how does this, how does any of this end up in the book? Hmm. And the answer was, okay, well, let's get Lee high. <laughs> That's that's wonderful and and yeah I, I absolutely love this approach. By the way, a, a reminder, guys, we are talking about the land of milk and honey, which is a part of the Walk Among Us novellas uh, that are available on uh, Audible or any audiobook uh, libraries out there, um, and they are they were published by Harper Collins. And uh, I actually want to step away from the topic of Lee for a little bit, although I love her as a character, which like again I feel guilty for saying because she's not that much great of a person, but I just I love her. Um, but there are all like various other vampires and kindred in general mm -hmm. who are featured in the book and they vary very much when it comes to their age and when it comes to their behavior. We have some more elder Camarilla vampires, we also have uh, thin bloods. So um, what was your approach to that difference in the generations in between the various characters you wrote about? Yeah, so um... I realized that for an operation like this to be functioning, you need to have permission. Mm -hmm. You need to have support. Um, and it is a very risky operation. It has great uh, benefits, but they're limited benefits. And so, you know, how, who's going to be, you know, you have to have pretty high up thumbs up in order to be running this commune that doesn't really feed many people, mostly produces unfractionated, but still bagged blood. Um, it's not like that great of a, of a system, but it has promise. And so I needed Lee to be in contact at least some of the time with essentially her superiors, um, most of whom do not really have any interest or approval of what she's doing because all they see are the risks because it is a very, it, it, it relies a lot on this concept that you can make your commune members not use their phones. You can make your commune, commune function in such a way that the local human government doesn't get suspicious. And it's just, it's a, it's very weird. It, it relies a lot on trust and in particular actually trusting the humans that are involved mm -hmm. um, because they don't know what's going on, but you know, you're trying not to ping their, their red flag buttons of, Oh no, something, something's happening. Um, and, but at the same time, they're not going to have an issue with the idea of humans as food. Obviously, of course. they've been around for a while. Um, whereas if you have a fairly new thin blood, especially somebody who comes out of, um, you know, some of the, the subcultures in Portland, they're going to have a big issue with that. They're going to have a huge ethical problem with that right off the bat. But they're also going to be very potentially susceptible to ideas of, well, we're doing it better. We're mm -hmm. doing it more humanely. We're more ethical. We're thinking about it. We're innovating. And so um, I knew I wanted to have somebody young because Lee's not that young person. She has enough understanding of what she's doing that that's not, you know, she's confident and, and also willing to twist things a little bit. So we have, um, you know, a thin blood named Kasim who is, who is approved by the Camarilla or else he wouldn't be able to work on this, on mm -hmm. this commune. But he's also in a way our audience, our reader stand in of, 
he has to have things explained to him and he has to be convinced of things. And it he doesn't always get fully convinced um, because he's outside of the bubble, yeah. basically. He's, he's He can still say, what the hell are we doing here? And Robin, <laughs> I don't know uh, if I like this. And, and Lee still has to use those like powers, discipline powers, like all, for example, to try to make her words a little bit more, you know, persuasive towards him because she mm -hmm. knows, I think she deeply knows that this is not fully ethical and this is not exactly what he would agree with. So she uses she her really vampiric powers. Him. Yeah. She wants his approval. Yeah. That's the biggest, it, it, because if he says he gets it and he understands, or if Robin, this human who gets involved, if she were to find out what's going on and she accepted it, that means she's right. Yeah, so and I want to yeah, I want to actually more. step away from from vampires and talk about mortals, or specifically about the one mortal, Robin, who is uh, very much of a centerpiece of of uh, your novella, and uh, about her la relationship with uh, with Lee. Of course, not getting into too much of a spoilers, but uh, I feel like um, like when I was listening to the wonderful wonderful voice actress which is uh, voicing uh, voicing Lee, and I could hear the obsession in her voice and in her behavior as well which very much mimicked a lot of the very good role playing toreators they've like i've met in my life and uh, uh, how did you approach that deeper emotional level level of a vampire towards a specific mortal yeah so um i mean sort of it's this interesting combo of lee thinks simultaneously that you know, Robin understands her and approves of her and, and, and all these things that, that Lee herself is desperate to, to have from somebody else while also being like, oh, but she can never know. Mm. And so there's this, there's this constant um, tension, which I think is, is almost like a, a drug in some ways that Lee, if it were one way or the other, if Robin just understood and loved her and, and knew everything from the beginning, that's not as engaging. That's not as, ooh, dangerous. Um, but like I mentioned, you know, this this possibility that this person could understand. Um, so it goes from an, an initial infatuation with the art because Robin is a spoken word artist um, and Lee has been stalking her performances for a little bit before the start of, of the story. It goes from there and then as Robin wants to work mm -hmm. on with the paperwork and wants to work with the livestock and all these things that Robin is, or Lee is desperate to share with somebody, it's, you know, she's almost, she likes to think of herself as helpless in the face of this and that, you know, and that Robin wants all of this. Um, I'd also listened to this audiobook by, it's the book You by Carolyn Kepnes, which is also a Netflix series, mm -hmm. which is deeply disturbing um, to listen to because it's this guy who is obsessed and is addressing the entire book to this woman who doesn't know. Oh. And it is, and the voice actor in that audiobook is also just, you know, some lines that he delivers, you're just, you know, you get shivers because you're like, oh, that's not good. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to reach for a little bit of that as well of, of just like, you know, Lee is trying to convince us and it, or is, and is convinced herself that what she's doing is okay with, with the sheep and the humans, that she's setting things up and, and controlling her interactions with Robin but she's, it's like, oh, it doesn't, you know, I'm just making things smoother. It's fine. I'm mm -hmm. in control. I'm in control of all this. I'm not doing anything weird. She has, she can consent. And there are some issues there too, because, you know, she's a five decades or so old Toreador. She has, you know, yeah, she's drinking bad blood, but she's a little bit hard to resist if Absolutely. she wants to, if she doesn't want to be resisted. Um, and so there are certain times when Lee, our narrator, is aware of that. And there are some times where she's not, and she's very carefully going, Oh, that wasn't me. I wasn't mm -hmm. doing that. Robin was doing that. Robin wants that. And so we, um, in a lot of ways, we don't actually get to see the real Robin until near the end of the, the novella. We only see the herd that, that Lee assumes she understands. Yeah, because like Toreators very often do that. They um, impose, you know, the, the image that they have in their, in their brain over someone, which is not really true. They are not seeing the true person, but something that they consider very beautiful, right? And this is their obsession. And uh, I, I've seen this like uh, attempted at role play many times, but I think your novella shows it in a, such a wonderful way that I am going to recommend it to everyone who ever wants a role play Torator. It's just, it's wonderful. It really, really uh, does the great job in that. So thank you so much for writing it. Absolutely. <laughs> And I think it is coming out in print um, oh. next spring. So oh. if, if audiobooks are not people's jam, although XC Sand does a great job of, of being Lee, as you've mentioned, um, keep an eye out because I think 
you know, there'll be more news on that relatively soon. I don't know the exact date, but I know that there's a plan to have ebooks and probably print as well. Absolutely. So. I wanted to have printed on my desk very badly. So thank you for that information. And uh, yeah, when people, when Vampire the Masquerade fans got to know you, through your novella and liked your writing and uh, fell in love with either Lee or Robin or other characters. What are the other books that you have written that you could recommend to them? Or maybe some of your upcoming um, books that you are writing right now? <laughs> yes. So um, the Lumin both The Luminous Head, which is my caving novel that is that is out now and also from HarperCollins and Yellow Jessamine, which is this other, which is the novella from a small um, queer horror publisher, Nian Hemlock, are very much about um, these sorts of uh, codependent, deeply entwined relationships between women. So they are all a little bit different in terms of who has, if the narrator or not the narrator has the power of how they approach each other of the situations that they're in. But if you're sort of, if you're interested in pursuing that sort of weird, this isn't healthy, but I'm fascinated <laughs> sort of story, those two are both great. Um, Luminous Dead, as I mentioned, is sci-fi and it has a fair amount of um, body horror and action and there are cave collapses and, you know, hallucinations and Yellow Jessamine is about poison and grief and paranoia and, you know, what it happens when sort of the world, the life you've built for yourself comes to collect the check. Oh, um, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> and then next year, I'm going to have another book out called The Death of Jane Lawrence, which is much more uh, traditional gothic horror. You know, mm -hmm. woman gets married to a man she barely knows, ends up at a, at a potentially haunted house on a hill. Things get weird, but it has the lovely addition of calculus and cocaine and Victorian surgery. So if those are also your jam. <laughs> I am sold right now. <laughs> That's amazing. So where can we follow you to get news about uh, all of these wonderful things that you're writing? So I am most active on Twitter and on Twitter I am at C-S-E-E -E underscore Starling and I also have a website CaitlinStarling.com that I keep pretty relatively updated that has interviews I've done, podcasts, all that sort of thing and uh, sometimes some excerpts or even knitting patterns. So <laughs> feel free to check that out. That's, that's wonderful and thank you so much for sharing your talent with our community. Uh, it was really a pleasure to listen to your novella and I I'm saying I really would love to role play with you one day. So if you ever want to step I'll into the world, <laughs> yeah, if you ever want to step into the world of Vampire the Masquerade from a role playing perspective, just let me know. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, have a great day, guys. Please go follow uh, Caitlin Starling on Twitter at C underscore Starling. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, guys. So, uh, yeah. Oh my God, that was the the interview with the author I wanted to do for a long, long time. It's the interview that, uh, of course, followed the past interviews which we did with Genevieve Gornicek and uh, with uh, Cassandra Koch, who are the other authors for Walk Among Us novellas. And uh, I specifically keep this one for the last, as it's also the last of the three novellas which are featured in Walk Among Us, and it really. Like for me, as I said before, it's one of the um, banner like products of culture, which I'm going to give to people who want to role play Torators or want to ever get a little bit more into the mindset of, of uh, what the Torator could do, could think and how that obsession could work like. I absolutely love that novella and I really hope that you guys enjoyed it too. If you didn't, you can check it out on um, HarperCollins website. You can see all of the different platforms on which Walk Among Us is available on. I personally listen to it on Audible, but uh, there are a lot of other platforms that it's available on as well. So, next news, guys. We're going to World of Darkness game developers panels on EGX, which uh, combine the developers of Vampire the Masquerade, Coteries of New York, and Shadows of New York, Vamp uh, Rafe the Oblivion Afterlife, and Werewolf the Apocalypse Heart of the Forest. They sat at one table and talked about developing games for World of Darkness. Uh, before I will talk more about it, maybe it's best to hear that from the devs themselves. Let's see the trailer. It's about being angry, about rage, about seeing the world as it is and reacting emotionally to it. It's about becoming a wraith and finding out how the world works. It's about feeling alone, it's about feeling unimportant. I look at the system, the more I see how re relevant. 
especially in 2020. Especially in 2020. So EGX happened this week, but uh, if you actually missed the panel live on Twitch, it is available on EGX YouTube right now. I'm going to post it on World of Darkness social media tomorrow for you guys, but you can of course jump in right there today and watch it after the news show. It talks about, uh, I mean, the developers during the panel talk a lot about how it was to develop uh, games set in the universe that they are all super passionate about. They were all role playing in um, how it started for them so how the ideas for these game games commenced and I've been actually checking out um, a lot of the you know community members asking the question how do I ever make a World of Darkness game which is uh, absolutely valid question it's something that I was you know also asking a few years ago and I also very much wanted to have an answer and I think this panel is uh, you know uh, putting a little bit of that curtain away and showing you how it looks like behind the scenes and I really loved listening to uh, uh, all of these developers because they are all extremely passionate about the setting in which they're working with but also they are so different. Their approach to development of these games is not only different in how the idea started, uh, what were they most fascinated with before they started development, but also in how these games are in the end. Uh, Shadows of New York, which is the new game from Draw Distance, is uh, as much as it's still a visual novel, it's very much of a different game than Werewolf the Apocalypse, Heart of the Forest. And uh, as a visual novel fan myself, I love to see these differences and see how different stories walk best in their own space, in their own mechanics. And uh, as a fan of Shadows of New York and a fan of Heart of the Forest, I can very, very safely recommend you both of them. And then we, of course, have Rave the Oblivion Afterlife, which is a VR game. It's a horror game, completely different uh, um, you know, like engine and uh, gameplay and a way to play than uh, the other two of the games, but it's still set in the same universe. It also tries to tell you a story. And how these games tell the story, I think it's uh, uh, it's very much shows in the gameplay itself. I really hope that you will be able to see that in Rave the Oblivion Afterlife as well as uh, you were able to see it already in Shadows of New York and the demo for Heart of the Forest. Speaking of Heart of the Forest, by the way, uh, all of these folks that you can see on the screen are avid role players and developers of Heart of the Forest set um, did a little dev diary in which they were talking about how they developed a game which is based on the pen and paper system and how exactly it worked for them as the role players. Let's watch it. I think that a big challenge of adapting a pen and paper RPG for the digital medium is the amount of choices. When playing a live session with friends, you know that anything can happen. Creating this anything within a video game would come at a huge cost. Thus, we can offer only a spectrum of choices, a section of what you can imagine co człowiek jest w stanie wymyślić. No i myślę, że sztuka tu jest taka. I think it's all about making these choices interesting and making sure there's enough of them with important consequences so that when playing within predefined limits, I feel like I'm shaping my own story. There is no game master on the other side, but still I'm playing a tabletop werewolf game on my computer. So that was the dev diary from uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse Heart of the Forest developers. They are posting these dev, dev diaries uh, almost every Wednesday. They haven't posted one this week in particular, but that's because they were doing the panel. They were pretty busy, but you can expect them um, appearing on Wednesdays on their social media. So go follow different tales if you're wondering more about what these guys are cooking. Heart of the Forest is one of the games I'm just so hyped for because it is, it's going to be ultimately one of the best introductions 
introductions to werewolf the apocalypse setting that we have out there in the world of video games really it's something that explains you the whole of the lore and invites you there as a stranger right in werewolf the apocalypse Earthblood, you play as kahal who is already a werewolf and it's uh, much more of a you know um true werewolf experience from the get-go while heart of the forest is a little bit more of an invitation to the werewolf world and i feel like it's going to be very much appreciated by people who are new to the system or those of you who are jumping from vampire the masquerade to werewolf the apocalypse and uh, of course i really hope that it's also going to be fun for a bit werewolf the apocalypse players but uh, i hope with the quality of the game and the writing it's going to be a no-brainer but uh, we have more news incoming and I know that you guys are um, awaiting a lot of the news about a lot of different products, including TTRPG products, of course. Uh, we w don't have any TTRPG news as for today, but uh, we hope that they are going to come very quickly. There is a lot of work being done in here, I can promise you on that, uh, but nothing to be shared just yet. Uh, but we are going to talk about another uh, thing that uh, I feel like a lot of people were waiting for, for us to talk about and I'm very happy to finally be able to share with you Vampire the Eternal Struggle 5th edition release date and that is going to be Halloween uh, on the October 31st we're going to have the um, the, the release of uh, the fifth edition of for Vampire the Masquerade uh, Eternal Struggle. This is of course the card game which has uh, a lot of the fandom already. It's been around for a long time. Actually, I've met a lot of people in my life that have hasn't haven't really played role played Vampire the Masquerade or even haven't read the books, but they played Eternal Struggle. So there's a lot of people like that out there. The game is and uh, you know was, but but I think with fifth edition is going to be uh, super super fun to play and uh, if you want to go to the uh, Black Chantry Productions website you will be actually able to see the full deck list for the starting clans and that is going to be 5th edition Clan Malkavian, Clan Nosferatu, Clan Toriador, Tremere and Ventru. The full deck list and previews of the cards as well are available on the uh, Black Chantry Productions website and uh, also additionally the information from um, BCP is that the uh, um, the, the, the cards from the 5th edition are going to be legal to play in the tournaments starting from December 1st. Uh, Eternal Struggle has a very big tournament scene, which, uh, you know, of course, right now it works a little bit differently because of the pandemic, but uh, uh, the tournaments are still happening around the world. And if you want to participate in, in them with the 5th edition cards, of course, check out your local regulations and make sure that you're safe. But uh, you will be able to play with these cards starting from December 1st. So uh, that's the information about the, the board games and card games for this week. Uh, we are we, In general, we have a lot of the board games and card games coming, and we're talking here about Vampire the Masquerade Chapters, Rivals, Heritage, uh, Blood Feud, and uh, of course, um, of course, Eternal Struggle being one of them, and uh, as much as uh, they might seem to be, you know, uh, set on the in the same setting, they're all very much different from themselves. And I feel like uh, everyone is going to find their little path, which they're going to play with their friends. I personally like to play all of them, <laughs> and I enjoy, um, you know, I, I checked uh, Vampire the Masquerade Eternal Struggle because of of my friends who were playing it, and they were teaching me how to play it as well. Um, I've learned how to um, how to play Rivals, and I'm going to probably learn how to play heritage very soon so uh, i recommend you guys to check them out and see how you enjoy them if you go to world of darkness.com website there is a board game section and a card game section as well and in that section you will have all of the planned board games and card games listed with the links to the publisher sites with the information about how many players can play these and the release dates as well so uh, all of that info is on our website if you guys want to find it. I'm going to jump back into the video game news and that is uh, a little bit more hmm, novel slash video games news because we're talking about choice of games Vampire the Masquerade Night Road which is coming next week. 
Let me just uh, jump in here. There we go. Perfect. So um, the interactive novel from uh, Choice of Games written by Karl Marquis is going to release in exactly one week from now on. Some of our community members were able to play it already in the playtesting that Karl Marquis was uh, uh, getting a lot of the community help with that because, you know, these games are super huge. There's such a lot of underlying mechanics and choices that you can choose. Um, because of the lack of graphics, uh, these games are um, very much more rich in the content itself because you can ultimately do like things starting from car chases to tons of different clans introduced and tons of different characters because you're basing on text mainly but the game is actually also featuring some artwork so today i want to give you a little bit of a teaser for the night road by showing you the already announced characters with their beautiful portraits uh, camera keys uh, will be the guest for our show next week as well so uh, we had him on the show back in the days as well in one of the very first episodes of the new show but he's going to come here next week and we're going to talk about his favorite moments of night road and of course i would love to showcase some of that game to you guys as well so when it comes to the character reveals very quickly let's go uh, back to the basics of night road what's the game about and vampire the masquerade night road is about uh, you as a vampire courier who is delivering information i think that's the very basic um, gist of the story and based on that we can actually make some connections as we are checking the characters so, Leto is the eagle prince of Taxon. With the Second Inquisition hunting vampires across the US, he needs the best career money can buy. Since they're all dead, he's using you. And of course, we are looking here at the Camarilla of the 5th edition, who is, uh, in general, not very much keen on technology. Of course, there are some princes out there, looking at you, Prince Cross, uh, that are a little bit more accustomed to the usage of technology and are a little bit more allowing for that. But uh, Leto, in particular, is one of those more old-school princes, which, after the fall of Shreknet, said, you know what, guys, we're not going to use the internet anymore. It's not a safe way to, um, to share information. We're going to use couriers. And you're that courier who is being sent around um, to um, to deliver information from the prince. If you're going to actually be a very uh, coy and very loyal servant of the prince, that's all up to you. Because you will meet other characters which you may ultimately side with. There is also Julian Sim, who is planning for the future, a future for vampires despite the dangers of technology. But when everything is just a game, sometimes you lose track of who's the pawn. I'm not really sure what is the background on Julian. I can only assume that uh, it's about trying to uh, get a little bit away from that traditionalist Camarilla view and actually use technology de despite of its dangers. Um, will that cause some tension with Prince? We gotta see in the game. Another character we have is the Dove of Mudros, who used to drive the desert highways as a free courier. Now she's a prisoner of her obligations to the prince, and she watches your car with envious eyes. I don't really blame her, because you apparently will be able to modify your car in Night Road and boost it up to be able to deliver the information more quickly and maybe outrun whatever is chasing you. I'm not really sure if Dove of Mudros is going to be one of the characters chasing in particular, but they do seem to sniff a little bit of a jealousy plot in here. So um, yeah, I also absolutely love this, this avatar. It looks wonderful. The next character is going to be Invidia Cole, who fled the occult libraries of her Tremere masters to establish a xenogenetic research facility. Your job is to tell her that her funding has been cut off. I'm not really sure if I want to make her my enemy. On one hand, I am uh, traditionally like very much inclined to make Tremere my enemy in all the role-playing games I play, but uh, she seems to be a super interesting character. So I feel like in this particular case, I might actually want to side with her. We'll see about that. And the character that I suspect you're going to run from a lot is the relentless operative of the Second Inquisition, Agent Donati, uses fire, sunlight and treachery to cleanse the world of the vampire menace. 
Of course, it's not only other vampires and supernatural creatures and uh, trying to stay loyal to the prince that are going to make you up on your toes when you're on the way as a courier. There's also Second Inquisition on the way because, you know, we're living in the world, in the times where humans are actually extremely dangerous to vampires. And I feel like her face is uh, probably going to haunt me in the nightmares after I play this game. I hope not, but we'll see about that once we uh, play Night Road. And that's going to happen next week on Thursday. It will be available on Steam. And uh, yeah, you can already wishlist it if you want to. Choice of Games have free games available on Steam uh, when it comes to Vampire the Masquerade setting. And that is Night Road, which is going to come first. Then we have uh, Out for Blood, which is a hunter-esque kind of a story. And then we have Parliament of Knives, which is uh, focusing a lot more on the politicking of Camarilla. Night Road is uh, going to uh, contain, as you probably have seen from this portrait, characters of many different clans, many different backgrounds, and uh, ultimately your choices are going to shape who you will be in the game and how you're going to side with different characters or maybe just be a solo player and just go through it uh, alone. Um, there are multiple endings, of course, there are very, very uh, various ways of playing this game. If you are wondering how Choice of Games uh, games in general are working, I recommend Choice of Vampire, which is uh, their, uh, I think, one of the most famous vampire um, titles uh, in the interactive novel sphere. I think it's free or at least the, the, the majority of it. It's free and you can actually get it on mobile as well. So you can uh, check out how this plays and if you enjoy it, I'm sure you're going to enjoy Vampire the Mask with Night Road as well. Uh, how much will it cost? These games are usually, I'm not really sure about the, the exact costs right now out of the blue, but these games are usually very cheap. So choice of games uh, titles, they differ from $6, you know, around that. So I'm not really sure like per se how much this game is going to cost, but you can check out the choice of games library and uh, compare the prices around. Uh, they are usually very much affordable. Um, checking for more questions. Choice of Vampire, that is the, so Choice of Games is the name of the publisher and the a particular vampire game that they've made before is called Choice of Vampire. So you can also find it on Steam and if you'll find Choice of Vampire, uh, it should pop up very quickly. And I believe it was also written by Cal Marquise. Uh, chat or the viewers on YouTube later on can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel Kyle was also involved in that previous one as well. So... Um, so yeah, this is going to be a super interesting uh, title and I would love to give you guys a little roundup of it after the release as well as I did with Shadows of New York. Uh, you know, all of these games as we're going to release, I want to give you a, a glimpse on them so you can decide yourself whether this is something for you. Uh, as for now, guys, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of World of Darkness News. We had Caitlin Starling as our guest, and again, I cannot recommend you enough uh, Walk Among Us trio of novellas. This is uh, a kind of a content I didn't know I waited for so much, but once I listened to it and it finished, and I listened to the very last sentences of The Land of Milk and Honey, I was just sad that it was ending. Um, it was uh, also one of the, um, or actually the uh, particular audiobook that actually made me listen to audiobooks. <laughs> right now, because of Walk Among Us, I started listening to audiobooks way more. So uh, thank you to Cassandra Cole, to Genevieve Gornicek, and to Caitlin Sterling for writing these awesome novels and uh, putting them in the collection Walk Among Us, which is just uh, um, one of my favorite Vampire the Masquerade products this year, for sure. It's just something that made my life way, way more fun going out with a dog, listening to it on my, on my headphones. It was really wonderful. And I recommend you guys to, to check out. You can also, um, with many of the audiobook um, uh, systems, with many of the distributions, you can actually get a free trial for a month and uh, listen to Walk Among Us during that trial and decide later on whether you want to continue. This is a thing with Audible for sure and I'm sure there are other audiobook uh, distribution services which are offering very similar 
um, think. So you can check it out yourself and see if this is something that you would like. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for joining. We're going to be joined next week by Kyle Marquise from Vampire the Masquerade Night Road, and we're going to celebrate its release. Until then, don't get lost in the night, and see you in another one.